So uh, next we we talked about calculating the cost of equity at the different percentages of debt. So we have now our cost of equity at the different percentages of debt. So the next thing we need to do is calculate our cost of debt at the different uh, percentages of debt. So we need, what do we need to calculate our cost of debt? How did you calculate your cost of debt in the project? What kind of things do you need to know to, know to calculate cost of debt? The market value of debt. For the cost of debt, what do you need to know? It's a simple one. Most people got correct. You need to know the default spread. How can we know the default spread? Check and the rate. Check and the rate. We get the default spread from the rating. Okay, where do we get the rating from? Rating agency. If there's no rating agency, the interest expense ratio, right? If we don't have the rating agency. So in this case, we just have the rating agency only for our current situation. Okay? So actually we're going to need to use the interest expense ratio because the rating agency is telling us just the rating for our current situation. Currently we have 30% debt, 70% equity. Okay? So we're going to start with uh, we have our debt to equity ratio, we have our, we know our debt. Uh, we find our interest payment and our EBIT, EBIT, so we get our EBIT divided by our interest expense to get our interest expense ratio. And then we put this into the table. If you can remember, we had a table where we checked our interest expense against the uh, <coughs> we check the interest expense against the rating. So we had an expense ratio for the companies which has a lot, big companies, more than five billion. And we had an expense ratio for uh, companies less than five billion. So this is an example of the default spread, right? So we know our company is this rating. Then we know our company has this default spread. Add on to the US government bond. Well, to find the rating for our company based on the interest expense, we can uh, just uh, review. Uh, interest coverage ratio. So here we found out that the ratio is 9.5 to 12, our rating is, is A+, plus, right? It's 2.5 to 3, B+, plus, and this is the default spread, okay? So we find our, our uh, ratio, interest, so-called so interest coverage ratio, can you calculate the interest coverage ratio? It's not that difficult. EBIT divided by interest expenses. Okay? Anyway, it's an open book exam because you need to do calculations. So if you see this question in the exam or you need to calculate the interest coverage ratio, go back to the cost of capital, right? And EBIT over interest expenses. Okay? In the question, you should have an EBIT and you should have an interest expense. So if we look at our question here, do we have an EBIT? Do we have interest expenses? Yes. We have the EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. We have our interest expense. We put EBIT over our interest expense, we get 23.24. Okay? This gives us a ratio, which is quite strong. It's going to be AAA. Clearly the debt is very low. At 10%, that's a very low debt to equity ratio. So it makes sense. You should always be checking. Do these calculations make sense? Does it make sense that we have the top rating for Disney at 10% ratio? Yes, we have hardly any debt. So yes, it makes sense. We have a strong rating. So then we add on the default spread for AAA. We go back to our table. 
here, and we find the default spread for AAA, and in this case it's 1.25. We add on the 1.25 to 3.5, which was the risk-free rate at that time, and we get 4.75. Okay. So this is our pre-tax cost of debt. So this is how we calculate the debt at every level. Okay, then, if we increase our debt at 20%, then our debt number will go up, our interest payment will go up. Does that make sense? If our debt goes up, our interest payment goes up? Yes. Okay, we're going to use this number as the interest rate, right? It's a little bit, this is problematic because it's a little bit circular. We need to do this to find this. And then we need this to find out what's our interest expense. Okay? So it's not, it's not perfect. Some of these things are not perfect, but we're making estimation. So we just use the same interest rate at every level to calculate the interest expense. Even though the interest, expense, the interest rate will be getting higher at higher levels. Okay? But we need... The reason we do that is we need to know this first to calculate our interest expense to get this later. So as our interest expense here goes up, this number is going to be going down, this ratio. As this ratio goes down, we'll go to the table, find the number will be lower, getting lower. As that number gets lower, the rating is going to get lower, go down from AAA to BB. As the rating gets lower, the default spread is going to get higher, and our cost of debt will go up. Okay? Do you have any question about calculating the cost of debt? In this case, we need to use the interest expense over the EBIT. So when, once we know the cost of equity and cost of debt, we can calculate our cost of capital at every level. So we can see cost of debt after tax, we use after tax cost of debt. The same for the first up to here, cost of debt is the same. We have AAA rating up to 20%. Then the cost of debt starts to get more expensive for Disney. Okay? Cost of equity also goes up. So on each of these, we find the weighted average, 10% debt multiplied. 90% equity equals 7.68, okay? So, can you tell me what is the best debt, debt ratio for Disney? Here we have debt ratio on the left. What is the best debt ratio for Disney? Can you read? Do you have the slide in front of you? 7.9, 11.3, 7.9, 7.32, 7.32, 7.33. Is that the best one? Yes. Okay. So that's around 30%, 40% debt. Okay? At 30 and 40% debt, Disney has the lowest cost of capital. So therefore, we think that that's the capital structure Disney should have. It should have about 60 or 70% equity and about 30 or 40% debt. That is going to give Disney the lowest cost of capital. So, Disney currently has about $16 billion in debt. The optimum dollar debt at 40% is roughly $24 billion. So, what do you think? Can Disney take on more debt or not? Is it better for Disney to get more loans or not? Disney's debt is about 16.68 billion at the moment, or well, maybe around 25 or 27 percent. But we just saw that the best debt ratio would be to have 24 billion in debt. So, if Disney wants to do this to go to this ratio, it means they need to borrow 8 billion in money and buy back stock with that money. So they have more debt and less equity. Okay. So borrow the money and buy back the stock. So this is the optimal debt ratio, 40% for Disney. Here. So we can see that 40% for Disney is not the lowest cost of debt. Lowest cost of debt is at 0, 10, 20. But it's the best combination between cost of equity and cost of debt. 
So it means that Disney's rating is not going to be AAA. Instead, it's going to be a lower rating, maybe A, in that case. So at its optimal depth rating of 40%, Disney has a rating of A. But sometimes managers are not happy. They want their company to have a higher rating. They say, we want our company to be rated AA for their reputation or other reasons, okay? So if they insist, if managers say, we have to have an AA rating, then we say the optimal death ratio changes to 30%, okay? And anyway, it's the same. Some managers might say, we want AA rating. We want top rating for our company. Even though it's not the cheapest cost of capital, Anyway, we want our reputation, we want AA rating. Then the optimal debt ratio would be 20%. Okay? We can see that from the chart that uh, cost of equity at 0 is 7.9. Cost of equity at 20 is 8.58. But cost of debt stays the same. And here we're using more debt. So at 7.45, the cost of capital for the AA rating is lowest at 20%. But we can say that there is a cost. If we want to have the AA rating, what is the cost? We just find the value of the company at 40% debt minus the value at 20% debt, and we, the difference is 1 billion. So we want to have an AA rating, it's going to cost us 1 billion. Maybe not worth it. Okay? So then let's just quickly look at our cruise and Fuxcape, the other two companies. So this is for our cruise. Uh, we can see, interestingly, for our crews, this is their cost of capital, also called weighted average, WA, cost of capital. Their lowest one is here, at just 10%. Okay, 10% is 13.42 cost of capital. So according to this, our crews shouldn't have much debt. If our crews has a lot of debt, cost of capital is going up a lot. Okay? So we can see that if our cruise takes on more debt, we also have to remember that this cost of debt includes the default spread for Brazil. Brazil is a more risky country. So as our cruise takes on more debt, the cost of debt is going to get higher and higher, right? very high, because our cruise is a Brazilian company. We also have country risk for investing in Brazil. So therefore, our cruise has an optimal debt ratio of 10%. Okay, so maybe we could say generally, in the emerging economy, they might have a slightly lower optimal uh, debt ratio. Okay? Their bond rating is D at 50%, means don't invest in this company. Their cost of debt is 20% at 50%, right? So, just there's a note here that instead of just using one year's uh, income, for the interest expenses, they use over four years average. What about the private company, the bookstore? How can we find out, you want to make a bookstore, how can you find out the best debt to equity ratio for the, book, the private company? Well, we don't know their uh, <coughs> uh, market value of equity, so we have to find their market value of equity. How do we find our market value of equity? We get their net income and we find the price to earnings ratio for our bookstores and that's how we, we get an idea of their market value of equity. So the bookstore's net income last year was 1,500 or 1 1.5 million. This number, I'll just explain the price to earnings ratio. It's useful to know in finance. Just price to earnings just means the market value over the earnings. Or we can do the stock price over earnings per share. So it means that uh, <laughs> our company makes this much profit, but how much is our market value? So industry has an average. So it could be that this is 10 over 1. 
So we're making about, in that case, we're making about 10% of the equity, right? Our earnings is about 10% of our stock price. Are you happy with 10% return? Depends on the risk, right? Depends on the industry. So whatever the industry is. So just currently in the US, the stock S&P 500 is very high. So the price to earnings ratio is very low. The price of the stock is very high compared to the earnings. Right? If we look at the graph of the S&P 500, it looks like this, right? Historically very high. So it means that the company's stock price is very high, but they're not earning as much money. So people use this as a way to decide buy or sell shares. The price to earnings ratio is very low. The earnings is very low compared to the price. People might say, I don't want to buy the stock now. I'll wait until the price to earnings ratio. And some people say, once the price to earnings ratio goes over below a certain number, it means the stock market will start to fall. They use that as an indicator. But in this case, we're using it to calculate the market value of Putscape. So, market value of equity is their income multiplied by price to earning ratio for the industry. And then we can get their market value of debt by finding the present value of their leases, like you did in your project. And if we know the market value of debt and market value of equity, then we can find our uh, debt to equity ratio, and so on. Okay? So, we go through here, we find the, uh, the same way, we find our cost of equity and we find our cost of debt for each, each level for this company. And we find our cost of capital. So we find our interest expenses in order to find our cost of debt. We get our bond rating and default spread. Okay, we use our beta for our cost of equity. Remember that for the private company, uh, we, have, we made an equation to change the beta to take out the benefit of the undiversified risk. And we end up with cost of capital. So we can see for Hookscape also around 40%. 40% here, this line. This is the best debt to equity ratio for the company. So there's a general rule of thumb which says that for companies, your debt to equity ratio shouldn't be more than two debt to one equity, right? But we can see generally here, Disney, the other companies, we're talking 40%, around 40% debt seems to be their best uh, ratio where their cost of capital is going to be the lowest, okay? So we can go through and do, it's a long calculation, uh, it will take a while, you need to use Excel, right? Find the cost of capital at each each debt ratio and find out which debt ratio is the best one. Do you have any question about this part? No? So, uh, just there is some limitations of this approach. <laughs> it's not perfect. It is static. Uh, the operating income stays the same. The bankruptcy cost stays the same. The beta and ratings are not changing that much. So if our income changes and our bankruptcy cost change, our beta and ratings could change, but more. So indirect bankruptcy cost, we talked about it briefly before. If I have a rating of B or D, what could happen is you stop doing business with me, okay? Because you think I'm a risky company, so you, you, you cancel your contract with me. That's indirect cost. Do you understand indirect? Something we didn't expect. So I take on a lot of debt, and let's say I'm Ara Cruz, and I change my rating, Ara Cruz, to D or C, C or D. You're my US customer. You might look at my rating and say, I'm not going to buy paper from that company anymore. Their rating is too low, okay? Or you're my supplier. You say, oh, I don't really trust that company to pay me money. They might not be able to pay me. So you give them some more difficult payment terms, right? They have to pay in one month instead of six months. So basically, this doesn't take into account the effects that those indirect costs can have on our, on our income. 
So that's the criticism of this this one, right? When we when we get more debt and we get some much lower rating, we can get some indirect costs of doing business. Our customers might switch to another provider. Okay, our suppliers might not trust us as much. So this, our beta could, could be higher in, re in reality if that happens, or ratings could be worse. So, <coughs> this is just explained here. In this case, we can make an enhanced cost of capital approach, where we can try to add in these costs. Okay, the indirect cost of bankruptcy are built into the expected operating income. Okay, so we just make a guess. We make a guess at what's that worth. So we can add this in here that our edit will go down as our rating goes down. Okay? So if we have a D rating, we are going to say that our profit will be down by 50% because of the indirect cost. Okay? Uh, some example of that is a company is making some machinery, heavy machinery. They have a lot of debt. You don't think they'll be able to finish your contract. Contract is going to take a long time, one year or two years. So you say, I'm not going to make a contract with that company. Okay? They might go bankrupt before the one year or two years is up. So therefore, their profit could be lower. So we made some kind of guess. If I have this rating or this rating, it could have this effect on my profits. Okay? So my EBIT will go down, my interest coverage ratio will change as my EBIT changes, okay, EBIT over interest expense, my rating will get uh, worse at different levels. So if we add in the indirect back bankruptcy cost, then the optimal debt ratio drops to 30%. Disney, it was 40%, changes to 30%, okay? So we can also, if we want, to make more accurate, we can do this way. <clears throat> so, this is a framework. Framework means plan or decision tree for getting to the optimal debt ratio. So first we ask, is the actual debt ratio greater than or less than the optimal debt ratio? In Disney's case, what's the answer to this question? Is their actual debt ratio bigger or smaller than the optimal one? Smaller. Right? In Disney's case, it's smaller. So let's uh, say that the actual is less than the optimal, in Disney's case. Is the firm a takeover target? Do people want to take over Disney? Yes. Then increase the leverage quickly. Uh, make our company look better in the short term for the takeover. Okay? We're not a takeover target, the usual case, no. Then the question is, does the company have good projects or not? If we have good projects, yes, then we need to get more debt and we can pay for the projects. Right? Do you understand? Disney, we don't have enough debt according to the optimal debt ratio. So we have some good projects like Disneyland in Rio, it's a good project. Then we can use get loans to pay for that project. In that way, we can increase our debt, make a better cost of capital. Hey, no. We don't have any projects. Do your stockholders like dividends? Yes, then pay, pay more money in dividends to the stockholders. No, then we can buy, buy back, get a loan and buy back stock. Okay. On the other side, <coughs> perhaps in the case of our cruise, our actual debt is higher than the optimal debt. Is the firm under bankruptcy threat? Do we think we might go bankrupt? Yes. Then reduce debt quickly. How do we reduce debt? This is a good question for companies in trouble, right? We can do an equity for debt swap. We can tell our lenders, sorry, we're in trouble. We're changing your loans to equity. Would you be happy to hear that? No, the equity is more risky and the company's in trouble, right? We can sell some of our assets, use the cash to pay back debt, Greece. Greece is selling its ports. Greece has some of the world's biggest ports. Sell the ports, get the cash, pay back the loans. Okay? Renegotiate with the lenders. Greece is doing right now with the EU. Okay? So we have to get rid of the debt. We have too much. 
then we are not under bankruptcy, no. Do we have good projects? No. Pay off the debt with our earnings. Use our earnings to reduce the debt. Do we have good projects? Yes. Right? Then when we're paying for the new projects, don't use debt. Use equity or return to earnings to pay for the new projects. Okay? So this is like a table. Follow the, ta follow the arrow for your company and you'll find out what to do. After you find out your best debt to equity ratio for your company. So we, d we don't need to do many drastic, the only case where we need to do a big change is if we have a bankruptcy trend. We need to do things quickly. Otherwise we can adapt slowly. We have a new project, use more debt for our new project. Okay, on this side. On this case we have a new project, use more equity for the new project. So try and balance in that way, over time. So this is Disney. Is, we said that it goes on this side. Is the firm a takeover target? No, nobody's going to take over Disney. Does the firm have good projects? No. Do my stockholders like dividends? Yes. Then we can pay, uh, take a loan and pay dividends to the stockholders. Okay, so then just finally, we're just going to finish up just very briefly to talk about dividends. Uh, we have now finished the great part of the course. We talked about the investment decision. This was the main part of the course. We just talked about the financing decision. The financing decision is the right mix of debt and equity. How much debt and how much equity should we have? Okay? So finally, we are just going to talk about the dividend decision. The dividend decision is, should we give money back to our stockholders or should we keep the money in our company? So just before we uh, do that, let's discuss about just what we learned about the uh, today. So just discuss with your partner this this what we discussed today. How can we find using numbers, using calculations, how can we find the right financing mix for our company? Do you understand the right financing mix? What does that mean? The right mix of what? Where do we get finance from? So what are we talking about? The right mix of? Okay, so discuss with your partner what we discussed today. Use it, how can we calculate, using calculation, how can we find the right mix of debt and equity? Okay, what do we need to do? This slide can help us here. Okay, so just discuss with your partner. Using the calculation, how are you going to show for your company how much debt we should have and how much equity we should have? So I need to discuss this with my So we have uh, 20 minutes left, it's enough time for the attendance list to go around, so please pass around the attendance list quickly, don't leave on your desk.
Okay, so can anybody tell me the answer? What do we need to do to find the right mix? Calculate the right mix? This slide is helping. What do we need to do first? What's the first step? Find the cost of equity. And what? Find the cost of equity. At different levels of what? So as our debt, debt changes, our cost of equity changes. Okay? So first we find the cost of equity at different levels of debt. We already explained company with more debt is more risky. When we make our we find our unlevered beta, we have to lever up our beta. It's going to change the cost of equity. What's step two? The next step. After we find our cost of equity at different levels of debt. Find cost of debt at different levels of debt. Right? Then then find our cost of capital at different levels of debt. Okay, finished. Is that three clear steps? Okay. Which cost of capital gives us the lowest number? That's the best debt ratio. Okay. Find our cost of equity at different levels of debt. Find our cost of debt at different levels of debt. Find our cost of capital at different levels of debt. Cost of capital is weighted average of cost of debt and cost of equity. Okay. Then we just look at our table and find which one has the, where is the smallest cost of capital. This is our best debt to equity ratio. Okay, inside this, the more complicated one is calculating the cost of debt because we need to use the interest expense. Okay, we find the interest cost of debt, we have to find the, the uh, interest expense at each uh, different level of debt. If I have 20% debt, my interest expense is going to be higher than 10% debt, right? As my interest expense goes up, my EBIT over interest expense ratio goes down, I have a worse rating, and my cost of debt goes up. Do you have any questions about this? No? So then let's just finish the last part about uh, dividends. So actually the last slide is probably the clearest one to explain about dividends. Uh, it's quite common sense. Deciding whether to pay back dividends or keep money in your company really is common sense. Okay? So let's have a look at this graph. On here, on this side we have poor projects. On this side we have good projects. Do you understand good projects? Good projects, something nice project we'll make money from. Poor projects, not very good projects, we're not going to make money from. On this side we have cash surplus. Do you understand cash surplus? Our company has a lot of cash. These days companies have a lot of cash. They made, the stock market went up, people are buying stock in their company. They're not hiring a lot of people yet, right? They're using technology instead. They're sitting on, historically, the most cash ever, right? Companies in the US, I think probably also in Korea. They're sitting on a lot of cash because they're waiting, waiting, waiting for the economy to recover to invest in projects, okay? So they have cash surplus. Uh, if they have a cash deficit here. So we're looking at four types of company. A company which has a cash deficit and poor projects. Company which has a cash deficit and good projects. Company which has a cash surplus and poor projects, or a company which has a cash surplus and good projects. So each of them have a different dividend policy. So let's look at first of all cash deficit and poor projects. Our crews. Business is not going well. 
and they don't have many good projects in the paper industry. So, are they going to pay dividends to their stockholders? No. Yes or no? No. No, right? It's common sense, right? We don't have much cash, we have poor projects. Anyway, we don't have much cash to pay to our uh, uh, stockholders. The next case is Intel. We have a lot of cash. So we say this is a little bit like companies after the crisis. The US government made the QE program, right? Japanese government QE program. That just pushed up the stock price of the company a lot, right? Companies' profits are starting to go up, but they think the economy is not that strong. So they think our projects are not that good. We still have some poor projects, but we have a lot of cash, right? So what should we do? Should we pay out money to our stockholders or not? We have a lot of cash and no good projects. Yeah. Yes, pay money back to the stockholders. It's common sense, right? We have a lot of cash now. We don't have good projects to invest in. So why won't we give the cash back to our owners? Back to the stockholder, okay? So we are going to face pressure from our stockholders or our owners to pay money to the stockholders as dividends, okay? or stock buybacks, which will push up the price of the stock, and they'll get some. Uh, when I'm a stockholder, there's two ways I can make profit. By dividend, by the stock price going up. The company buys back stocks, the stock price goes up. Okay? So, uh, next case, we have Apple. A lot of cash and good projects. Do you think the Apple Watch is a good project? Did you buy the Apple Watch? Is it a good project? No. No, Apple thinks it's a good project. <laughs> right? So what are they going to do? Pay back dividends or don't pay back dividends? Hmm? Right? They have the most flexibility, but don't, probably don't pay. Invest the money, reinvest the money in the company, in the new project. In the future you can make even more profit. Okay? If you have a good project. But they have the best flexibility. They can decide more easily. They could pay back some and also invest in dividends. What about Disney? Disney doesn't have much cash, but it has good projects. Are we going to pay out the stockholders with dividends or not? Pay the stockholders or don't pay the stockholders dividends? We have a lot of good projects, but very little cash. Give our cash to our owners or not as dividends? What do you think? I don't have any cash, but I have a lot of good projects I want to do. Should I pay money in dividends to my owner, the owners? No, why not? Yes, we have good projects, we can increase the profit in the future. So a lot of companies, they don't pay Microsoft didn't pay dividends for 10 years, right? Because of this reason. Okay? Why? Microsoft had a lot of good projects. So, stockholders were happy. They're not making money just from dividends. Microsoft's stock price was going up, right? So, most stockholders, when they look at their return, they look at difference in stock price from the end of the year to the start of the year, plus dividends. So, if the difference in the stock price is good, then I don't get paid dividends, that's okay, right? My stock price went up. So, uh, some young company don't have much cash, they're not going to pay dividends for the first five years, first six years, right? They continuously have good projects. Microsoft has Microsoft Office, right? Then the Xbox, and then something else, and something else. So, uh, they decide not to pay the money out uh, to the stockholders. So really this just sums up generally what we need to know about paying dividends to stockholders. Is that common sense? Is that common sense? Do you understand common sense? How do you say common sense in Korea, Korean? Doesn't translate? Common sense doesn't exist in Korea? <laughs> Ilban Sanchik, Ilban, common wisdom. Ok, 
Okay, so then let's look at the uh, some steps to the dividend decision. So we get some money from our operations. We get the profit, the cash flow from operations. Then we have to decide. We have cash flows which go to debt. We have to pay back the interest. Okay, we have we can also give cash flows back to our equity investor. So we have to think about how good are investment choices? Maybe we're going to reinvest in the business. We saw that this is the preferred source of money for managers, retained earnings. Retained earnings means keeping our profit in the business to pay for a new project. Okay? Or we don't have good projects, then maybe we have some cash to give back to our owners. Okay? Then we think, what is reasonable? Do you understand reasonable? What does, how do you say reasonable in Korean? Hmm? How many jogging? Are you reasonable? No? Sometimes not? So we keep some reasonable money for the company and we pay the rest to the stockholder in dividends. What do our stockholders prefer? Stock buy buybacks. Our stock price goes up or dividend payment. They get a share of the profit. <coughs> so we think about those things. Uh, in this case, where we, we can also think about tax. When I get dividends, I have to pay tax on the dividends, right? So if there is not much tax disadvantage for associated with the dividends, companies can issue stock at no cost. Dividends are not that important. If dividends create a tax disadvantage for investors, then maybe it's better to reinvest the money in the company. Is there a high tax rate for dividends? Payment on dividends? Uh, if stockholders like dividends, then we could pay more dividends. So we also have to think about our stockholders. Do they want a lot of dividends? Maybe Microsoft stockholder. Bill Gates was a big stockholder, right? Other insiders or large stockholders. They can say, no, we don't really need dividends. We're more interested in growing the company. Okay? So what do our stockholders want? We also need to think about it. So this is the common sense summing up on dividends. If a company has a lot of cash and not good investment opportunities, give the money back to the stockholders. Okay? If a company doesn't have a lot of cash and it has a lot of good investment opportunities, don't give the money back to the stockholders. Keep the money in the company. Okay? Uh, these are good reasons for paying di dividends. Investors in your company like dividends, right? People might want to buy your stock. They see it's a dividend paying stock. I'm a pensioner, I want to get dividends every year. Some payment every year of dividends, okay? Signaling to the markets. You're showing to the market I'm a very strong company. I can afford to pay dividends to my, my owners, okay? It gives a, a strong signal. The wealth appropriation story, so we can Transfer wealth from our lenders to our equity investors. So it can be better for our equity investors. So do you have any question about uh, dividends? Then we are finished the course. Uh, we discussed, which was longer? Discussing about this part, the investment decision, or discussing about this part, the dividend decision? Not very equally distributed, right? This took about 10 weeks, and this took just 15 minutes, right? So, discuss with your partner what general rules or common sense do we have for paying dividends? Or not paying dividends? So, what common sense rule can we follow? when we're deciding whether to pay dividends or keep the money in the company. Discuss with your partner.
what road should we follow when we're flying? Where is the attendance list? Did everybody sign the attendance list? Didn't just here? Okay, so who can answer? What is the general rule we should use? What are the two things we need to think about when deciding to pay dividends? Hmm? What? So when we're deciding to pay dividends, we think about do we have good or bad projects? Okay? What's the second thing we need to think about? Cash. How much cash do we have? So what's the rule? High cash, bad projects, what should we do? Pay dividends. Pay dividends. Low cash, good projects, what should we do? Don't pay, Don't pay dividends. Okay? So, uh, let's finish there then for today. Uh, the next class, we'll just do a review next Wednesday. And then on Friday, we'll have the test. Do you have any question about the test? Yes? Ah, yes. Good question. Last test, somebody told me that some students can cheat using Kakao Talk, sending the answer to their friend. So you won't be allowed to use your phone in the exam. It's an open exam with no phone. So you'll need to bring it, buy a calculator. It just costs Ocean One. You can buy it at the main gate, right? You can use a dictionary. Okay, you can bring an English dictionary to the exam. You can bring your laptop with an electronic dictionary, but no phone. Okay, you can't communicate with the other students during the class. Okay, any other question about the exam? Yes, we have a class on Wednesday, review class. Any other question?